All right, come on. All right, well, thank you very much. I am excited because today we're going to go ahead and uh, talk about uh, Paul the Apostle. Amen. And we're going to get straight into the word. But we, you know, we, we're having this uh, excellent weather. Me and John were talking about it real quick. And it's my, once the weather changes, once things changes, especially when it's good weather, you start feeling happier. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, when, when I see the sun coming out versus gloomy days, it's like, oh my goodness, when are these gloomy days going to end? When is it going to transition? And the minute the sun starts happening, there's a smile on my face. It's just, uh, I get a little bit more excited. And I wanted to talk to you guys about transition. You know, there was a time where uh, Paul the Apostle had transitioned from being a one who was persecuting the church to becoming a Christian. And you would think that that would be an exciting time. And it is just like yourself when you started seeing, man, I'm a Christian now. I'm a believer. I'm a disciple. I want to serve God. But what happens in that transition time when people start remembering your past and people start talking about your past? You know, it, it, it irritates me because people remind me of my failures. And it's like in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I don't need you to remind me of my failures because the things that you don't like about me, I don't like about me. You know, I need somebody to encourage me. I need somebody to tell me, hey, it's going to be okay. Hey, we serve a risen God. Hey, we, we have a, a, a hope that nobody else has. And you can only find it through Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. The, the only way you can come to the Father is through him. Tells me that I came to the place of Jesus Christ. That now I serve a living God. So stop. Take a minute. And stop telling people what's wrong with them and start encouraging them to say, hey, you know what? We serve a good God. We serve a risen God. And God can bring change in your life. So thank God for that. Amen. Thank God. I'm encouraging you guys to incline your ears. Incline your everything that you have inside of you. Stop thinking about the past. Stop thinking about your past. Stop thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. What is God doing for you today? See, because we all, you guys heard it before, when, especially during the hell night heaven and hell the great judgment throne yes there is that time but there we serve a god of today now of god of now you might wonder for yourself you might wonder at home it's like god i know you're real but why am i like this god i know you're real but why do i do this god i know you're real what are you going to do about this and i'm here to let you know that we serve a god of now that God wants to make some changes. God wants to make some transitions. God wants to change some mindsets, but he wants to change it in your heart. See, a lot of the times when we serve God, we, wanna, we want God to change them. When God really wants to say, no, I want to change you. You're the problem. You're the problem of me getting to them. So I need you to be on my side. I'm not on your side. You need to be on my side. A lot of us tell us that if we serve a God. Oh, God's on my side. He's my friend. No, I'm on his side. You know what I mean? So we need to start serving God that way. You know, stop walking around with this chip on our shoulder and say, man, I'm a Christian. God didn't call you to be a Christian. He called you to be a disciple. What's a disciple? One who's teachable. One who can be rebuked. One who can be followed up on. Oh man, follow up? I don't know about that because now it's called stalking. Now it's called manipulating. Now it's called pressure. Now it's called, you're just trying to get me to do what you want me to do. No, that's called follow up. I'm concerned. I want to encourage you. That's what follow-up really meant. And uh, so today, going back to Paul the Apostle, he's on the road. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 9, tells us that he was on the road. Where's my glasses? What am I going to do without my glasses? So hopefully I don't misspell any or misread any words. He says, where am I at? Saul the Apostle, he becomes a Christian. 9 chapter 1 verse uh, verse 9 uh, verse 1 it says meanwhile all right so meanwhile means that it, something was happening Dur during this time something was happening Paul was still spewing death threats against the Lord's disciples okay this is Saul he's he's out there he's he's telling people I'm going to kill you if you serve God I'm coming after you if you worship if you call yourself a Christian Guess what? I'm going to be knocking on your door. And when I get there, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good for you. He asked, Saul asked, asked letters from the high priest for, for, uh, for giving me the authority to go to synagogues 
to go to a place of worship, to come up to the Cure Church. He goes, give me letters that authorizes me to pull all the men out, all the women out, make them widows and kill these guys, stone them, bring them in chains and bring them, put them in either prison or kill them off. So he got these letters and he's on the authority. He's on the bandwagon. He's, he's, he's kind of like that mask police. Hey, are you vaccinated? Right? You know, you might say, well, it's not a law yet. You're right. It's not a law yet. But he's that kind of guy. He says, hey, are you vaccinated? Are you serving in the local church? Well, I got letters to say I could take you in prison. I got letters to say I can bring you in and change. See, your freedom is no longer freedom no more. I have this letter. I have the authority. And as, a, as Saul was traveling along and he was approaching Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed all around him. And he dropped to the ground and heard a voice and Saul, Saul, he says, why are you persecuting me? Saul's response was, you know, at this point he's afraid. He doesn't know what to say. He says, Lord, who are you, Lord? And that voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and into the city and you will be told what to do. Meanwhile, the men who were with him, because Paul didn't travel alone. Paul had an entourage of people. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to say. They were speechless. And they see Saul, their leader, on the floor. Now he's blind and they're going to help them out and go into the city of Damascus, the very city that he was gonna go over there to arrest these Christians. And as they're leading them, I noticed one thing, they couldn't do nothing for him. Why? Because they had no clue who Jesus Christ was. See, Jesus Christ is our healer. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And they had no clue how to tell him, hey, things are gonna be okay. All they could do was guide him and walk him to the city. The Bible tells us that he said he was supposed to go to this one place and just wait there. Wait until he's told what to do. During that time, for three days, he couldn't see. He couldn't see. That was out of his control. But because he couldn't see, he didn't eat. He lost his appetite. He was scared. He was concerned. He goes like, in his mind, he was doing everything right. In his mind, he goes, I thought, you know, because I was, I, I grew up, Paul was probably thinking, or Saul was probably thinking, hey, I serve God, but I serve him this way. Just yesterday, I invited a Muslim to come to my church. And he goes, I, I understand you're a Christian, and I, I know that you can't, I can't come to your church. I go, who told you that? I go, I'm inviting you to my church. In fact, you get to sit in the front row. I go, come to my church. He, obviously, he started laughing. But... Saul lost his appetite because everything that he thought and he, everything he believed that he thought he was doing right was just crushed. Was just, it's over. And he's blind. He's helpless. See, this is a guy that liked to have control. This is a guy that thought he was on a mission. Most people that serve God the way they do, it's either through religion or it's either through tradition. Through religion, it's because it makes you feel good. If I'm staying activity, if I'm punching in the clock, if I'm showing up to Sunday, I must be doing good. Or if, if because my parents did this and I'm doing it, this is why I'm serving God. What he didn't have was an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, just like we did. We, we, the reason why we are here was because we had an encounter. I hope you are not like Paul, who is just punching in the clock and say, I'm, I serve God at the Cure Church Nashville. Why? Because... I don't know, that's what everyone else is doing. So I believe that God wants to do a work in your life. So for three days, he couldn't eat, he couldn't see, and he didn't eat or drink anything. Now shifting places, now in Damascus, there was a disciple. Notice that he said disciple, not a Christian. There's a disciple. See, Jesus Christ already passed away by that time and resurrected. But there was a disciple. I'm telling you guys, there's something about that word disciple. I believe that God really wants you to become a disciple. He, he, the Bible tells us go out in the world, make disciples, teaching them to obey, obey baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God wants you to be a disciple. 
He doesn't want you to be a Christian. Take that thought, take that mentality out of your mind. See, because a lot of people say, hey, I'm a Christian, but they don't live like a Christian. But you'll never hear somebody say, yeah, I'm a disciple. I'm a student. I'm a learner of the gospel. So now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called out to him in vision, in a vision said, Ananias. And he said, answered, here I am, Lord. See, if you're a disciple, you're always going to be in position to hear God's voice. See, you're not a powerful man if you're not a praying man. God cannot move in your life if you're not moving in his life. If you're not saying, God, here I am. God, I, speak to me. I make my, myself available. I give myself away. I have overcome. You can never sing these songs with authority. You can never sing these songs with confidence because you don't know what it's like to overcome. You always give in. You, you give in to the flesh. You give in to this world. You give in to society. And you fail God in so many ways. But when you come to the point, the saving grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you start overcoming. You start saying, here I am, God. You start saying, I gave myself away to you, God. And anything and everything that goes on in my life, I understand it's for a reason, it's a purpose. And it's because I'm glorifying your holy name. That's why we serve God. So Paul the Apostle gave his life to the Lord at the time he's, he's Saul. And then the disciple is across town and God's speaking to him. He says, hey, I want you to go to this guy's house. In this, in this house, you'll hear of this man. His name is Saul. He's praying. In the vision, he's seen a guy named Ananias. Whoa, your name is Ananias. He's seen Ananias in a vision come lay hands on him. Think about it this way, guys. In the beginning of the story, Saul was on the verge. He had letters to come in and kill the Christians. If he found you praising God at the Cure Church in Nashville, in the synagogues, he had letters to arrest you, to throw you into jail. But Ananias answered this, Lord, I have heard many people tell how much, tell me how much this man has done to your saints. He reminded God of Saul's past. See, when you come into this church, guys, I understand people come in just like myself. I'm coming in vulnerable. I'm expecting to hear something positive. You know, you're looking at a guy at the very first time because my, my brother has been inviting me to church over and over again for an entire year. And at that time, I seen God do a transformation in his life. See, we were both addicted to drugs at that time. And the minute I'm walking down, I'm walking down, going to work, going back to my position, I see him in a trailer and he's with this Christian guy and this guy is praying for him. And I'm like rolling my eyes. I go, you're seriously gonna be a Christian now? Dude, you've done as much dirt as I have. There's no hope in Jesus Christ. And I started telling off this Christian, I'm telling off all these other Christians, you guys are all hypocrites. And when, when reality is, I'm the one who's lost. And I tell my brother, I tell my younger brother, the only reason you're becoming a Christian is because you're contemplating suicide because your girlfriend left you. I go, you're weak. I and mean, you're going to use Jesus Christ as a crutch. You're a hypocrite. That was that. Yeah, I loved my brother back then. What really bothered me is he gave his life to the Lord. Now I don't have nobody to party with. Now I don't have nobody to compare myself with. Now I feel like he's going to judge me. He's going to talk about my past. So I see him growing. I see people coming in to my house and following up on him and say, Hey, brother Mauricio, you know, how, how are things going? Hope you're go doing good. And uh, it's like, I see them outside my yard and it's like, Oh, great Christians. And I have to walk home. And then as I walk, walk through, they're having a conversation. I started cussing. I started verbally cussing because I didn't want to make myself approachable. I, I was trying to intimidate these people. And one guy who is not afraid of people, not afraid of confrontation, today he's currently my pastor. He's the kind of guy that'll lean into you and say, hey bro, I want you to come to church. Here's the flyer. And I started mouthing up, I started cussing. And he leaned in even more. He goes, no, you're gonna take this flyer 
and I want you to come to church. I go, stop fronting. He started telling me, stop fronting. Stop lying to yourself. You need Jesus. You need to get saved. And he's like angry. And I'm like thinking to myself, oh man, this guy's from the streets. <laughs> I better, I better take a, I better, give me two flyers. You know what I mean? Kind of. And he's bigger than me. And it's like, what am I going to do? It's like, man, you know, I'm on drugs. I'm skinny, weak, you know, compared to this guy. Later on, I, you know, you guys know the story. I've told you guys, I ended up going to church and I see him. And right away from, from far away, he's so excited. He's so engaged. This is what disciples do. They get, hey, bro, are you going to go to the Christmas dinner? And, you know, I, I want to come to church. I want to be relaxed. And it's like, you know, don't, 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 don't come that close to me. It's like, we don't have that kind of history. And then I go, are you going to go? Are you going to go? And then it's like, man, I don't, what do I tell this guy? I go, man, I just got off drugs. I, I, he was like, well, you think I have money for a Christmas dinner? And then right off the bat, I go, no, I'm not going to go. I don't have money and everything like that. As I'm talking to him, he walks away. And then it's like, man, what did I say? And I'm confused, so I start talking to somebody else. And you got to understand, I'm shy. I don't know. I don't have much friends inside the church. And I'm talking to somebody else, and I see a big old hand. He goes, you're going to... You're going to the Christmas dinner, bro. I just bought your ticket. And I'm like, whoa, man. And he says it that loud. He, today, he still speaks that loud. You know what I mean? I mean, this is my pastor. You don't need to give him a microphone. He'll preach. So I took it. And you know what I loved about my pastor at that time? He wasn't my pastor. He was just a person in the church, a person who followed up on my brother. He didn't ask me to sit by him. He just wanted me there. His testimony is similar to mine, only his is a lot more, crazier. And I ended up going to church and I made more friends. And I, you gotta understand, I didn't speak properly. I'm at a table. There was girls on the other side and the guys were on this side and we're talking and my, I'm like, man, yeah, and that guy pissed me off. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like talking and my brother leans over. He goes, hey, we don't talk that way here. And I'm like, man, did I say something wrong? And uh, there, was, there was a girl leaned over. She goes, don't worry. We understand what you said. We, we understand what you're saying. And so it's like, okay, I got to transition. I got to stop. I'm not living in the past. I'm not, I'm not thinking about the past. And here Ananias is telling God, God, he's the guy that got these letters to kill us off. He's reminding God of his past. See, sometimes... When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is not going to remind you of your past. If God is not going to remind you of your past, why are we going to remind people of their past? You know, there was, a, there was a woman that was caught in adultery. And all these religious people, all these church people come up and they throw the woman in front of Jesus and say, This woman was found and caught in adultery. What are you going to do about her? The, the law of Moses, the Bible says we should stone her. What are you going to do? And Jesus looks at these guys, get knees on the floor, and he says, he that has no sin, let him cast the first stone. You know, you guys wanna make a big deal of this. Let's make a big deal about your sin. Let's talk about you guys. One by one, they all walked away. And he tells the woman, he goes, we're your accusers. Now don't get, get, the, don't get, this, don't get this twisted. God does not want anyone to sin. And he says, don't do that no more. Go your way and sin no more. That's as simple as that. He's not gonna bring it up. He's not gonna say, okay, sister, this is where you started wrong. And then let's, let's do a 12 step program. No, he didn't say that. He just said, stop it. Don't do it no more, go your way. I don't condemn you, go your way. So Ananias ended up going and laying hands on Saul. And as he walks in, he goes in, he says, Brother Saul, I'm here to lay hands on you. And he tells them, and as he prays for him, Saul regains his eyesight. See, I believe that God had blinded Saul. He lost his eyesight so he can get insight. See, what he didn't know and what Ananias didn't know was Saul was called to preach to the unbelievers, to the Gentiles, to kings, 
to Israel. He was called for that reason. God said, he is my chosen vessel. See, the problem is, a lot of us think we need to clean ourselves up before we can be used by God. A lot of us say, think that we need to talk a certain way. We need to go to a seminar. We need, you know what? God can use anybody. God wants to use anybody. You know, it's not about ability. It's about availability. If you don't make yourself available, God can never use you. You know, the Bible tells us that, you know, when you see somebody preaching in the, sto uh, in the corner and just proclaiming the God good news to, to a lot of people, to a dying world, that might seem foolish. But to God, he's like, he's doing my will. So don't ever think, think about it this way. Paul the Apostle who wrote about 13, 13 books in the Bible, 13 to 16 books in the Bible, he wrote them because somebody came up and laid hands on him. Somebody helped him transition from being a, a, a guy who lived on the road to Damascus to, on the, to a guy who's now living in a road where it's God's road. It's God's will. So if we were to read the story, continue to read the story, Let's, where am I at? Oh my goodness, I should have brought my glasses. So Ananias left and went to the house and he laid hands on Saul. And in, uh, I already told you, Brother Saul, the Lord has, Jesus appeared to you on the road as you were traveling and sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. All at once, something like scales fell off Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after eating, after eating some food, he felt strong again. Guys, if you ever go through a, a state of depression, please, that's not the time to fast. You want to feel good about yourself. Make sure you get some food. Make sure you get fed, right? But after eating, there's a time for fasting, but there's a time when you're going through a depression, don't, don't refrain from eating. Make sure you eat. And after eating some food, he felt strong again. For several days, he stayed with the disciples at that time, at that point. The disciples in Damascus, the people that he was going to arrest, he started staying with them. He started hanging out with them. For several days, he stayed with the disciples in Damascus. He immediately started to preach about Jesus in the synagogues. Wait a minute. First, he was going to go to the synagogues to arrest the people. Now he's preaching the people in the synagogues. Right? But what I told you guys before is all biblical. He was actually called to preach to the Gentiles. He was called to preach to the unbelievers. You know, sometimes you'll see Christians be more Christians when they're talking to other Christians, right? It's like, I'm a Christian. Oh, you're a Christian? Well, God's telling me to tell you this, right? You're a Christian? Well, praise the Lord. God's telling me to tell you this. No, no, that's salt. The Bible tells us that we are the salt of the earth to go out and salt the earth, not salt other salt. And this is where we get it twisted. Oh, I'm a Christian and I can only hang out with other Christians. No, you're, you're a Christian. Go to the sinners and tell them about who, Jesus Christ. Go out and salt the earth. Be a salt. You know what looks like salt? Sugar. God's not telling you to be sweet about things. He goes, season it with salt, just a little bit, just a little bit. Just what you want to do is preserve their life and tell them, hey, Jesus loves you. And if they're not having it, they're cussing. All right, no problem. Back off a little bit, but just salt a little bit. And the next time you come back, put a big old smile on your face. Hey, remember me? I'm the guy who invited you to the church. <laughs> God's good, right? A little bit of salt. That's all you're doing. Don't condemn them. Or like my pastor did, you're going to church, right? That guy wasn't being salt. He was like being salt and pepper. You know what I mean? He was like throwing it all in there. But God's asking you to be salt. Be friendly. You're preserving relationships. So here we are. Saul is kind of out of the will of God. Even though he's doing right, God is preparing him for something bigger and better. So maybe the synagogues was his training place, but he felt the urge, I need to preach the gospel. He was changed, he was delivered. So was my younger brother, who was once uh, uh, a drug addict, 
and he was contemplating suicide. Now he's proclaiming the good news. And I remember the first time when I went to Bible study for the first time, he finally got me to go. He says, we're going to outreach. I go, what the heck is an outreach? What, what is outreach? Oh, we're just going to go and pass out flyers. All right, we're on the street corner passing out flyers. And this is easy. Okay, hey, you know what? You know, I'm just following everybody. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Not making no contact. All of a sudden, I hear this guy on a bullhorn preaching up a storm on a bullhorn on a bus stop. And he's proclaiming God good, good news. And I turn around, it's my younger brother. And it's like, whoa, he's on the bullhorn. I'm like, man, has something happened? And I'm like, uh, I'm really attracted to that, man. And I'm like thinking to myself, it's like, man, that, that's so awesome. And people are laughing at him. People are driving by, honking them, flipping them off and everything like that. And my brother's just preaching away the gospel. So he turns around and he looks at me. He goes, has, hands me the bullhorn. He goes, do you want to do this? And I look at the bullhorn and I go, heck yeah. All right? And I didn't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm doing. But I get on the on the on that uh, bus stop and I started preaching right there. All I could say was just Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you over and over again. And I'm right there. People are laughing at me, people are mocking at me, but but I have no, I don't know, I just had to love to do this. And I found myself proclaiming the gospel, find myself preaching on street corners. To this day, I remember I even got my kids and my family doing that. And you know how I, I said I, I used to be on the bus stops? Then I seen this electrical uh, box. And I go, that's a lot higher. <laughs> so, so I'm a new convert, and I'm, I climb it, and I'm on the street corner before church, and I'm proclaiming the gospel. And my Bible study leader drove, drove right by. And he goes, man, that guy is on fire. He felt convicted. He parked the car, let his wife go to church, get prepared for church. Well, he came in. He goes, hey, I seen you preaching. I felt like I should have been there preaching with you. And it becomes contagious. Yeah. Man, I think we need to do that here. Yeah. You know, when we first moved here, when we first moved here, uh, within a week, we found ourselves on the street corner of Bell and uh, Murphy Bro Pike. And some people came up to me. And one guy goes, hey, man, I hear what you're saying, but... You know, can you feed me? I don't have no money, no food. And I go, well, I don't have much. So we ended up buying them some crystals. I don't think I did any help by giving them crystals, but you know, <laughs> that's a joke. But you know, uh, we found ourselves street preaching here. And I, I believe that that's what the transition life does. So Saul had been tra uh, transformed and now he becomes a believer. But what happens when your past keeps on re your past keeps on coming up. See, everyone who heard him was astonished. These are the people in the synagogues. And they were thinking to themselves, this is the man who harassed those who were called Christians. They reminded themselves, isn't this the guy that was after the Christians? And they're reminding them of the, of the past. Didn't he come to bring the, them in chains? to the high priest, but Saul grew more and more persuasive. I thought about that. Paul did not back away. The Bible says he became more and more persuasive. Yeah. So if somebody tells you, hey, it's not for me, I don't want to, okay, then be more, more persuasive. You know what I mean? Think about that. I didn't say be more aggressive. I said be more persuasive. See. If your life is mediocre, if your life is lukewarm, if your life, if you don't, if you don't example who Jesus Christ is, and you're like one of those roller coaster Christians, sometimes you're good and sometimes you're this, you live for God on Sunday, but you live like the devil, for the devil on Monday, people are going to see that. Become more persuasive. Let them know who Jesus Christ is on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every day, every day. Become more persuasive. If they don't want to come to church, invite them to a men's dinner. Invite them to a men's breakfast. I mean, if you're a woman, don't invite them to a men's breakfast, right? But you, you get the idea. Take them out. Hang out. Be more persuasive. That's how I got 
addicted. I mean, me and my wife, we uh, we started going to church. Uh, we, I think we were in church during the Saturday night alive. It was, it was preaching of the gospel, but through skits, through plays. And they were acting. It was all funny. It was fun, fun, and just the setting was right. But they were still preaching the gospel. It became more persuasive. You know, in our worship, we we do worship. When my son is doing the guitar and he's doing the leads, that's not to attract you just to. Oh wow, he's a good guitar player. But no, this is your time where you become like he led you into worship. Now you start worshiping God on your own. You start telling God in your own spirit, thank you Jesus. So, going back, he continued to confound the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this man was the Messiah. Now, the Bible says in verse 23 through 28, now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the walls in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, I want you to stop right there. These disciples were different than Jesus' disciples. These disciples are helping Paul preach the gospel. They put him in the basket. They're going to lower him down the gates. All right, go do, go win some more souls. Because Saul was re really good. Paul was really good at preaching the gospel. There was an anointing on Paul. There was an anointing on his life. And somebody like a disciple who's not named is the one who's carrying Paul and letting him down. I mean, could you imagine? It's like, man, dude, this is better be for God, man. You're heavy. And he's letting him down. Those guys aren't even mentioned in the Bible. These disciples were different than Jesus' disciples. They were called the apostles. So, when he says this, Saul had come to Jerusalem. He tried to join the disciples. When he's been preaching here, and when he tries to finally go to Jerusalem, there was a three-year lifespan. He's proven himself for three years. But three years go by, these guys are saying, wait a minute, I still don't trust you. It's a trip, it's, it's amazing. Believers were unbelieving that he was saved. They were remembering his past and they didn't buy it, they didn't buy into it. It's funny how we as Christians, we buy into the fact that Justin Bieber is a Christian now. Wow, why? Why don't we, why, why, because he has a platform? I believe you become a Christian is when you start living for Christ, not just, you know, take away the platform. Are you still gonna live for God? Take away this Sunday, you're here at this church, are you really a Christian? On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Take away your platform. See, even the believers were unbelieving. It's like, man, he's not a Christian. But thank God for Barnabas. Barnabas is a nickname that he was given. It means encourager. Somebody stood up and says, wait a minute. Let me, let me read it. He goes, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. And he goes, and they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. It's kind of like this. Come here, come here. I'm taking you, man. Come on, man. Smile. Look at that. Why are you roughing me up? Yeah. yeah. All right, right. You're a disciple. Okay. No, no, they don't need to see you, man. Right. He's talking to the disciples. He goes, Daniel, this guy's a Christian and he plays the bass. We need him on the worship team. And you're going to say, no, I don't believe he's a Christian. I know he can play the bass. Not as good as you, Dad, but... You know, but I don't believe that he's a Christian. I go, he is. He's been proven. He's wearing a Jesus secure shirt. You can use him. Somebody like a Barnabas had to step up and speak to the disciples. 
to say he's a good guy. Let's use him. God has a plan for him. Amen. I think God wants to finish the plan by you sitting over there. Thank you. God, Barnabas got up and took him. When was the last time you guys got somebody and said, hey, come on, let's go to church. Encourage them. Let's go to church. It's good. This is a good church. Oh, I don't want people to judge me. They're not going to judge you. In fact, I'll even speak up for you. But before you speak up, make sure your testimony is good. See, Barnabas is not just one of those guys that had a platform. He lived it. See, Barnabas is first mentioned in Acts chapter 4, verse 36 through 37. He says, Now Joseph, a Levite and native of Cyprus, who was surnamed Barnabas, by the apostles. See, in other words, the apostles, his name was Joseph. His real birth name was Joseph. But all the apostles says, you're a Barnabas. You're a Barnabas. Man, you're, man, you're good. You're a Barnabas. You are an encourager, man. The fact that you're here encourages me. The disciples called him a Barnabas. He's son of encouragement. Joseph, Barnabas, he sold some field, something that he owned. He got the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. He goes, hey, I, I don't want nothing. I don't want no recognition. There's the money. Do it for whatever, the, for the kingdom. Without Barnabas coming up and stepping up, telling Paul about him, there would not be no Paul. There would not be no book that Paul has written from the Corinthians. See, maybe you haven't had anybody speak up for you on behalf of, behalf of what God has done for you. I'm here to let you know that you are in the right church. Maybe you've been running around. Maybe you've been like, man, I've just been hiding in church. I know of God and I've been scrolling back and forth on what's going on on Facebook. But I believe that somebody needs to speak up for you. I believe that God wants to change your life and stop worrying about your past. See, because God wants to do a life change transformation in your mind, your heart, in your life, in your whole transition, the whole works. He wants to do a whole makeover, an overhaul. That means you're going to have new friends. You're going to live for God now. You're not going to live for yourself. You're not going to live for the devil. Somebody says, would you serve God for a million dollars? Let me ask you that question. Would you serve the devil for a million dollars? You can answer yes or no. Yes or no? 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 See, because some of us are serving the devil for nothing. <laughs> we're, just doing, we're just serving the devil. But God wants you to serve him. So I'm going to ask you guys, with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody's looking around. This is a question. And you, you probably think, man, I've been here before. I've heard this before. But my question is, are you, make, are, are you ready to make a transition in your mind, your heart, your soul? Are you ready to give it up for the Lord? Maybe God's speaking to you and say, man, I, I was afraid to come to this church. I was afraid to, that people were going to judge me. Believe me, Paul the Apostle was being judged. Paul the Apostle was reminded of his past. But thank God there was a Barnabas that stood up and said, you know what? He's a good guy. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is trying to say, Hey, just come to the Lord. Maybe you need a Barnabas in your life. Church, if you're not a Barnabas, I need you to be a Barnabas today. I need you to start encouraging other people to come to church. Give their lives to the Lord. But if that's you, and you're far away from God, and you know that you're distant from Him, you need to ask God for forgiveness for certain things that, you're done, that you've done in your life. We don't need to know about it. But you know that you've done some wrong. You've offended God. You've sinned against God. Hey, believe me, this is something I pray every day. But if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, just please raise your hand. Nobody else is looking around. Amen. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Amen. Hands growing up. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
Those that raised your hand, I don't want you to think about it. I just want you to stand up. Just go ahead and stand up right there where you're at. Nobody looking around. Nobody looking around. Okay. If you guys meant that, I want you guys to look at me. If you guys meant that, whatever sin that you guys have done in the past, I'm here to let you know that God's going to forgive you of that. The Bible says he's going to grab that and throw it as far as from the east as to the west, never to be remembered again. I'm not going to bring it up. Holy Spirit's not going to bring it up. You know who's going to bring it up? It's going to be the devil. This is why the Bible tells us, forsake not the assembling of the brothers. In other words, don't stop going to church. Because the minute you're alone, the devil will remind you. But we're not going to remind you. Thank God nobody reminds me of my sins. And those things that you don't like about you, don't worry. God's going to fix that for you. Because there's things that I don't like about me that God's fixing. And I believe that God can deliver us. It's not going to take a 12-step program. It's going to be a simple prayer like this. I remember saying this prayer one time. And sometimes I don't even think I meant it. But I said it by faith. And after I said it, I tried doing drugs before, and I felt guilty. I've never felt guilty before. But that was the Holy Spirit doing something in my life. And I didn't want to do it no more. I didn't want to feel guilty. God changed my life just by a simple prayer. God delivered me just by a simple prayer. God forgot everything that I've ever done by a simple prayer. Amen. So just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you a sinner. I ask you for forgiveness for everything I've ever done wrong. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. And today, I confess you as Lord and Savior over my life. Come into my heart. Help me be the new person that you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, come on, come on. Give Jesus a clap offering. All right. Now, this is where it, it comes a little tricky. See, because God's called us to be a Barnabas. Yeah. What's a Barnabas? Encourager. encourager. I am not going to be the encourager today. I'm just a pastor. But I'm going to encourage encouragers to rise up and stand up by somebody who's next to you and just start praying for that person. Ted, can you pray for Mr. Lil Devon right here? Can you come around? Or pray for John, please. Ladies, can you surround our friend right here and pray for her? Come on, just encourage and pray for them. Miss Judy, yes, thank you very much, Pastor Maria. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and lay hands on them. Come on, Desiree. Amen. Desiree, she's praying for them. Amen. Hallelujah. More than yesterday, I need you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I pray, God, for chains to be broken this day. More than birds can say, I need you. Pray, pray, guys, and need your prayers. You, Lord, Be the Barnabas. More than the arrow. Amen. Rain. Speak life into their life right now. More than this song I sing. Words of encouragement. Words of encouragement. More than the next More than anything, and Lord, as time goes by, I will be by your side. I never want to go back to my old life. I need you more. I need you more. We need you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we need you. We glorify you. I need you more.
believe that God is doing something in the lives of people right now. And I don't believe that God has ever called any pastor to become a celebrity. But we're supposed to be servants. And I don't believe that any Christian that comes into church are never really meant to be called Christians, but they were called to be disciples. Jesus says, go out into the world and make disciples. See, because not, disciples aren't born, they're made. And the only way you can be made a disciple is you gotta be make yourself available. It's not about ability, but availability. Make yourself about available to the Lord. You've heard it said, God has a plan for your life, but you hold the planner. See, you get to dictate how much of God is going to be in your life. You can say, you know, Monday, God, I'm going to have you more in my life. I'm going to wake up early and I'm going to pray. Tuesday, I'm going to follow up. You know, God, I, I pray that uh, I'll, I'll check in and, and, you know, just ask somebody what's going on in the church or uh, get connected with an outreach or invite somebody. But there has to be changes in your life. See, because the devil will be waiting for us the minute we walk out. And it's going to be warfare. See, the devil will be laughing at you right now and say, Ha! Huh, you're a Christian now, huh? And he won't take you seriously. But the minute you start praying, the minute you start reading your word, he's like, that ain't going to happen. See, the devil is going to start attacking you. But God says, man, you're worth it. You're worth fighting for. And you need to start crying out to the Lord and start believing that the prayers that are you're praying are reaching the throne of heaven. Amen. We've always said that your life, your, your life with Jesus Christ is personal, but it's never meant to be private. Share with somebody that you're a Christian now. Share with somebody that you're a disciple now. Amen. Amen. We are going to close, but before we close uh, in the event, you partner with us, whether it's through the internet or here, if you need an offer an envelope, please raise your hand. My sister Desiree will, no envelopes, hey, it's right, no envelopes, uh, no envelopes, but uh, we'll, we'll collect it next week, guys. I, I apologize, but we, if you got have a Venmo account, you can Venmo the Cure Church Nashville or through our Subsplash, the Subsplash app we're on. But isn't God good? Yes. You know, most churches, they usually celebrate by going out to eat. You know, and I usually try to get you out soon so we can beat the Baptist, <laughs> right? <laughs> but today I go, man, I, I hate it. I not hate it, but I kind of don't like it. It's like some of us go out to eat, some of us don't. So I go, man, how do we eat together? So I got a barbecue pit in my car. We're gonna bust it out right now. Come on, we're gonna have some hamburgers and hot dogs and just fellowship. Please don't feel that you're obligated to leave. I, we want you to stick around. We want you. To, we want to get to know you. Uh, we always said that you're a family, uh, you're a visitor once, but after that you become family. Right, Mr. Ted? Amen. Amen. So, loan me a dollar, Mr. Ted. Oh, There's always that one guy riding in your family. Give me a dollar. <laughs> no, I'm not that guy. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Ted, man. It's like, I'm glad I remember. Now we have two Mr. Ted's. Amen. Now we have two Mr. You, you have to meet the other Ted. He's really humble, real, really great guy. Please don't go nowhere. Amen. In fact, give me your keys. No, just... <laughs> Amen. We are going to close. Maria, did you want to share anything? Amen. Uh, so please, we're going to transition. Michael's going to start cooking the hamburgers. So, you know, we're just going to have a good time. All right, guys. Be blessed. Get to know each other.